Hello, everyone. Welcome to, to the Pentabar uh, for, for today. And we are going to have uh, Sam Love uh, as, a ho uh, as, a, uh, uh, as an uh, invitee. And uh, we are going to talk about uh, product strategy in hypergrowth. Uh, she is the chief product officer uh, for WeFox, a unicorn in the insurance uh, industry. Uh, and she's going to talk about how is it like to, to work uh, for a unicorn. And she's going to give us a few tips and tricks for large scale product strategy. She's going to tell us more about um, how to build and manage teams when everything in, is in hyper growth. And uh, we are going to learn a lot from, from the challenges and the lessons she's going to, to share with us regarding product success. So uh, let's, let's welcome uh, Sam Love with, with us today. Hello, Sam, how are you? Very well, Andrea, how are you? Uh, very, very good. Uh, a bit nervous, but good. <laughs> I'm nervous. I've seen yes. the questions, I should be nervous. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, so uh, how is everything in Berlin? Because you are joining from Berlin today uh, and just for, uh, for our participants to know, I'm, I'm currently based in, in Mexico. So a very multicultural type of Penta bar today. Absolutely. No, things in Berlin are good, although it's starting to get a bit cold and gray, which happens at the same time we go into summer where I'm from. So I'm, I'm Australian mm -hmm. and uh, I have to admit that I find this time of year probably the hardest, even harder than February, because in February, you know, you're coming out of winter in November, <laughs> you're going into it. So a bit jealous of sunshine and warmth you probably have there, Andrea. Oh, yes, yes, definitely. <laughs> yes, uh, Mexico right now, well, especially Guadalajara uh, has very, very nice winters. They are more like spring. <laughs> Great. So uh, it's, it's very good to have you today. Uh, and let's start by uh, telling us a bit about yourself, uh, your career path and mm -hmm. how you actually got to, to work for WeFox. So happy to. So yes, I'm, I am from Australia and um, a bit of a funny path into product. And I think a lot of people have a funny path into product. There aren't that many people, certainly not that many people of my generation that set out to be a product manager. I actually studied actuarial science and mathematics at university. And I, I have to admit that I'm working in an insurance industry 10 years later has come as a bit of a surprise to me. Um, so when I, I finished university, I worked for a data and analytics consulting company, uh, which was founded by actuaries, but I was very quickly drawn to non-traditional areas, uh, largely media and, and marketing. So working for media owners and, and big retailers on enterprise products. Here we were talking about a product, not in the sense that we probably, many people on the call today think about a product, but really on a an analytics or a big data product like a personalization engine or uh, reporting suites with a lot of kind of intelligence inside. So the design decisions that we'd make back then were, you know, should it be blue or should it be green? And that was about the extent of it. So I, I was, yeah, kind of drifted into to technology and really enjoyed creating something from nothing and solving problems. So it was something that was really well suited to me and particularly in that space with the more kind of technical analytical side. Um, but five and a bit years ago, for one reason or another, decided to, to uh, move to Germany or didn't really decide to move to Germany. I was in Germany and I had, had left my job in Australia and wasn't totally sure what I'd do next and did a bit of research, found that product management was quite a close fit to, to what I'd been doing. So I applied for a product management role at a stealth mode startup. Uh, this was one of the Finleap ventures, it turned out. So the company, when I joined it, was, was three months old and built up the, the product capability, the data capability from scratch there. And I mean, it, it turned out to be true. It was a very pro product management in the more sort of formal sense was quite a close fit to, to what I'd been doing and had a lot of the same, um, let's say interesting problems to solve in B2B2C software. You've got a lot of complexity, which is something that I really enjoy. And I was there for, for three years and then um, decided to move on from there and got a message from Julian Tyker on LinkedIn saying, you know, what about, what about WeFox? 
I have to admit that I'd never actually heard of Refox, but um, in the say yes to everything mode, met, met Julian and heard his vision for what he wanted to do for one insurance at the time. So I, I ended up joining one as the CPO there. Um, and you know, six months or so later, took on the, the dual responsibility for one and WeFox product team, bringing them together under one brand in, in March this year. So this is, this is how I ended up here and, and back in insurance after all these years. Wow, that, that's quite a journey, quite a journey. Uh, so can you tell us a bit more about uh, WeFox? What mm -hmm. does WeFox uh, uh, do? Uh, what does it uh, stand for, users, and so on? Yeah, so WeFox has been on a bit of an interesting journey. So at the start of its its life, WeFox, well, not at the very start, but when I, I came into contact with WeFox, or what we call the orange WeFox, the primary focus was on enabling brokers to distribute insurance. So focusing on, on third-party sales and making that as easy as possible ultimately for the the sales agents who are working with the WeFox software also had our own in-house uh, what we call inno brokers who were the the primary users of the software and distributing third-party products and then a couple of years into that journey um, one was founded so one was a subsidiary company with a, a insurance license which was a digital insurer, started its life more on the B2C, so a bit more classical neo insurer. But uh, by the time I joined a couple of years ago, there was a strategic decision to really focus on distributing through intermediaries, which we've done to, to an enormous success. Uh, and then a third company was incubated as part of the group, which was really the platform play, the ability to connect distribution on the one side, represented by WeFox, and the insurer on the other. So this, this is what one was. And what we've done over the last 12 or so months, let's say, is brought them all together as, as one solution and one experience. And this has been a big focus for me personally, bringing that under one house, one technology platform. So while we have an insurance company and we have a very strong distribution arm, ultimately what, what we Fox will be is becoming the, the the connective tissue, if you like, of the insurance industry and our ability to have our own distribution and insurance has allowed us to build that quite rapidly and also without needing to guess what's important to, to both sides of, of that equation. That sounds like a very, very big challenge. <laughs> Some um, days more challenging than others. <laughs> yes, definitely, definitely. Uh, what what do you like most about what you are doing as chief mm. product officer? And maybe you can tell us a bit about uh, uh, how uh, about a day in your life. <laughs> I'm sure there are a lot of meetings as well. <laughs> there are lots of meetings. Yeah. I mean, what I've always enjoyed is problem solving. You know, I'm the, a classic creator and a fixer. You know, I'm not somebody who's good at sailing, sailing a steady ship. And I, I really enjoy when there's a lot going on and we've got very multifaceted problems. And, you know, when you, you kind of graduate into these management and leadership positions, you're not so much solving the, the complexity of, of a specific problem with the product or a specific user's problem, but you're solving organizational complexity. And I think that's what I get the most from in my job is when I see team members who are able to do things that they weren't able to do 12 months ago. I actually just had a one-on-one -on -one before this call with, with, um, with a colleague who's now been with the company nearly for two years. And we were just talking about that rate of change and that growth that, that she's had over those last two years. And this is hands down the most rewarding thing for me. So it's actually allowing other people and creating other, the space for other people to solve those problems that, you know, five, 10 years ago were the ones that I really enjoyed um, solving and, and working with them to, to give them the tools and then trying to, to replicate that as much as possible across the, the organization. This is what I enjoy the most. But yes, I mean, an average day, you know, looking at my calendar, we've had a two hour management meeting with the executive team, uh, one on ones with my team members. I had a, a value interview today with our, our um, 
our people and culture teams are also thinking about how we can support the overall culture at WeFox mm -hmm. and build that out. So I'll meet with our chief risk officer later today. Um, feedback on a web form so you're talking about all different levels of detail and abstraction with you know and I'm very lucky I get to talk to people all across our business as well as, as partners and potential partners outside so yeah, certainly no lack of variety. Oh definitely definitely sounds very very satisfying challenging at the same time if that's let's say one day in in your life um, and you, you talked about uh, talking a lot with the team and mm -hmm. trying to build build a culture. Do you see that as part of uh, of a product or a company's success as well? Yeah, I mean, I think it has to be. And I think, you know, I'm sure everybody says it's about this, their personal area. I think it's mm -hmm. critical in the product domain. You know, it's, it's still an emerging discipline. And I think it is done differently everywhere. You know, the way product is done in the Anglosphere, so in, in the States, in, in the UK, in Australia, is actually quite different to the way that I've seen it done in, in Europe. Mm -hmm. uh, and deciding what culture you want for the team, but also how that interacts with the rest of the business. You know, we, ha we work a lot with people who come from more traditional organizations into an environment like WeFox. And, you know, you get the question, well, what, what, <laughs> what do you do? And creating a culture where you're very open and engage the rest of the organization, I think is, is really important, but also one where you're very clear about how you make prioritization decisions and, and how you communicate those, I think is, is something that's fundamental to, to what we do. You know, we, you hear a lot about people who work particularly in Europe, you know, this idea of a feature factory, and that's a cultural thing, right? So this is something that, you have to make a decision about is what kind of product culture are you trying to build and, and who do you need to engage, not just within the team, but within the broader organization to make that a reality. Okay. Okay. That's, that's very, very good uh, insight. Um, what, what is WeFox's uh, recipe for success? Uh, how did you manage to, uh, become a unicorn, to uh, combine everything in order to succeed on an international mm -hmm. level? Yeah, I think it's, it's a really good question. I, I mean, honestly, I think it's because we just never believed that it wasn't possible. And I actually think this is something Julian Taika, who's our CEO, CEO really embodies. You know, it's it can't be done is just not part of the language that we we use and so far it's always proved to be true i mean you find a way and make something possible and i, I think just not questioning our ability to to do it i mean of course you always have doubts and some days it's like mm -hmm. oh man, <laughs> i'm not sure what the pathway is here um but just going okay i mean then it must be possible so why, why couldn't it be us that, that makes it possible? And, and how do you handle those, those doubts, those moments where, uh, when you think, well, we don't have what we need right now, or uh, there are a lot of things missing from, from the puzzle. How, how yeah. do you handle those, those situations in order to move forward and, and have the success that you have? I mean, you can almost always find a way um, and at the end of the day, I mean, my responsibility is to create that possibility. I mean, I have, I mean, a fortunate position as a, as a leader in this organization to really have everything that I need to make it possible. I mean, if we need more, more, more people um, mm -hmm. with our Series C raise, for example, I mean, we have those resources. And so it's about identifying what is the most valuable next step and then how do you, you get that and how do you make that, that possible? And it's just taking it, I mean, it, it sounds crazy because sometimes you feel like you're running, but it, it's really just taking it one step at a time, understanding what you're trying to achieve and then what you need to achieve it and trusting also that there are people who can help you do it. You know, you, you're never on your own. And uh, I think this is something that's helped a lot um, throughout the, the last couple of years. 
also so that's the key <laughs> yeah, don't, don't try and do it alone i think it's, it's, yeah it's yes good. definitely definitely there is a team behind uh, 100%. all profit success absolutely great and what is your your north star at uh, at, at free fox because i imagine you do have an overall objective. You do have a North Star that, that's guiding you in, in the right direction. Yeah. I mean, so our, our mission really is to make insurance 10 times better for everyone. And I think this is something that you can't do by doing what insurance is today and just do it better. So, I mean, insurance is fundamentally about protecting people and protecting their well-being and their lifestyle and to be able to do that at scale and this is where the platform piece comes in I mean if we can do it for ourselves that we can make our customers lives better through insurance and insurance like products there's nothing stopping us from from doing that industry-wide and providing those tools and so re thinking what insurance is and what it means and almost taking it back to the very beginning. Uh, you know, when, when you had a community of people who were protecting or pulling money essentially to protect their well-being so that they could go on, on journeys that they wouldn't have dreamed on otherwise, you know, sending ships out into the ocean. Um, this is ultimately what we want to do is, is bring insurance back to, to where it began. And that means I think rethinking it, working with what's there, but, but ultimately making insurance better for everyone because I think personally insurance has a, a lot of power to do good it's it's got a I think a deservedly bad <laughs> reputation and this is what we will change oh that's that's amazing um and in, in this uh in this challenge and with this mission and this north star that you have what do you think is your biggest achievement until now M mine personally um, uh, or the other companies. I, I think we can take a look Touch at both. Both. your personally and then within within the company and from a product perspective too. Yeah, I mean, personally, I, I mean, it has to be the team that we've, we've built within product. So when we started or when I, um, going into the, the pandemic, so back in March, 2019, we were 15 people. We're now 55, 56. Uh, and doing that, you know, bringing together what was seven different teams across the organization, doing that during a pandemic, all on, all on Google Hangouts, um, and actually creating a sense of, of team and something that works and a team that's delivering things, achieving things, getting better every day. I mean, this is, this is easily the biggest personal achievement for me. Um, and I think if I'd seeing what was coming, I would have questioned it, right? And this is, is what I was talking about before. You sort of don't almost have time to, <laughs> to go, well, can I do this? You just do it because it's, it's the thing to do. Um, so this, this for me is, is easily my biggest personal achievement. And, and from a product and company perspective, what could be yeah. the biggest uh, achievement? I mean, I think there's so much <laughs> that it, it depends on your angle. I mean, the one that I was involved with that really gave me a taste of what WeFox was about was, you know, right back at the beginning of One Insurance when we changed the strategy, we pivoted from B2B to, or B2C, sorry, to B2B2C. We launched a motor product in three months. Um, and this was all in an incredibly short period of time. This was, I think, we fox as its essence, you know, we, we just got it done and never questioned, is this possible or not? Because there wasn't time. And this, you kind of see again and again, we rebranded successfully again during, um, during all completely remotely. This was a pretty major undertaking, particularly for the product and the, the technical teams, of course, marketing and others as well. Um, the Series C raise, I mean, this was a huge, huge team effort with a lot of people contributing to that. We've launched new countries, you know, so every day there seems to be a, a big achievement that they start to become not normal, um, but it's, it becomes hard to measure what, what a, yeah, it's, it's funny. But the, the first one was the one that was like, okay, this, this is going to be an interesting ride. <laughs> 
Great, great. Well, it, it sounds absolutely wonderful, everything that you are talking about and the focus that you have on on the team and, and on the culture and on just getting things done uh, without thinking, uh, is it possible or or not? That's, that's great. Uh, we do have two questions from, from the participants. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of them touches a bit upon uh, what you mentioned uh, regarding maybe the different approaches in Europe, in, in Australia. Mm -hmm. So we have someone who is asking, are there any visible differences from product orient uh, orientation point of view between Australia and Europe? Yeah, so I mean, I've got to admit, I'm not super close to how product management is done in Australia, but have quite a lot of, of friends and people in my network who work mm -hmm. with American companies. Um, and the role of product management in Europe that I've experienced tends to be a little bit more oriented towards feature delivery than ideation mm -hmm. and research. You know, so the a PM, at, uh, let's take a fan company, uh, the ones that I know at least, they, they tend to spend a lot more time oriented towards the customer and the market, less orientation towards an engineering team. I think at, at WeFox, we're, we're probably somewhere in between, mm -hmm. but um, I've seen other organizations where the product manager really is just about coordinating the delivery of features. And this is where this kind of feature factory mindset can, can come in without the same level of orientation on, on the customer ultimately. Okay, I, I understand. And how did you manage to reach that balance? Because I, I know this is the, uh, the challenge for a lot of, uh, of companies because they tend to focus so much on, on delivering features and maybe less on integrating feedback from the users or talking to them in the first place before starting to deliver uh, features. So yeah. how did you manage to, to reach that balance? Because I, I think it's very, very difficult to choose one or the other. Yeah, I mean, we haven't reached the right balance yet. <laughs> I don't think, you know, I'd, I'd love to see the team focus more time, and I know they would as well, on 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 research and, and getting to know the customer and, and the user. I think we do it better than, we do it better at this company than I believe we did it at the company that I was working for prior to this. Um, but it's it's difficult, and I think it's it's interesting to be in a leadership role in a product environment where you're sort of like, well, tell me what you need. You know, mm -hmm. you don't need permission. You just need to do it. But then there's so much work to do. So every part of the value chain needs to be geared towards that. So for that to work, you need the engineering team to be taking more knowledge and interest in the, the delivery process. So they don't need that shepherded through by a product manager. So you've got to work with, with the engineering leadership to set the engineering culture to support this type of product management. You have to do more than give people permission. You know, you, we've got, a, I've got some teammates who are actually seeing one of our sales teams based, they've got to fly to Dusseldorf and then drive from Dusseldorf to, to somewhere else. So they're in the middle of Germany somewhere. And, you know, this part of our organization, I think, does a really good job of, of connecting with their end users, but they're also people that we work with directly. So that becomes a little bit more easy. So it's, yeah, more than creating permission, you sort of have to set that expectation that this is a core part of your job and not the part that should be compromised. I think as most many product managers, and I know myself when I was a product manager, you do feel like one of the most important things you do is make sure that the engineering team are busy and productive. You know, so this is the, the maybe spending more time on the building the thing right than making sure we're building the right thing. And I think getting the balance between spending your time understanding what the right thing to build is compared to making sure the thing is built right. Um, this is, is something we're always working on. So we haven't nailed it, um, but we, we are working on how do we create more space for that ideation and discovery process. Great. We do have uh, quite a lot of, of questions uh, okay. today. So we have another participant asking, what are your thoughts on go-to-market strategy? Mm -hmm. 
I mean, that's such a <laughs> such a general question. It's a broad yes, yes, yes. But let's take, for instance, the example of uh, of WeFox. Mm -hmm. What was your your go to market uh, strategy? Maybe at the beginning, uh, did that strategy change yeah. now that you have grown? Mm, yes and no. I mean, we were in a situation where we had a very short time frame. So the go to market was very worked on closely with our marketing teams, but also our broker sales team. So as we shifted direction, um, insurance is a very relationship based business, um, which is, it's strange because it's so vast, but when you're talking about the distribution side, it is really relationship rate based. So, you know, through conversations that people had at different fairs, we were able to kind of generate that interest in what we were doing. And then as soon as it was ready, we made it available to a smaller group of people and then to test. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm a big believer personally, unless there's a good reason not to, to put things into the world. I mean, they have to work or at least work well enough that, that you're not causing too much friction with customers because you have one chance with the customer. Uh, but to put them into the world and see what happens, whether that's as a soft launch or a beta launch, and to build on that incrementally over time. But I think there are other times where actually having a bit more of a big bang approach and creating excitement and energy around that is, is also important. So I think it really depends on the market that you're in and um, the distribution network that you've got in play. So for us, we've got a strong distribution network of advisors on the ground. And so they actually do a lot of the hard work of creating the interests. You make something available, they build that into their narrative. So we just have almost a constant rolling release of new insurance products on the one hand, but also features and making them available. So we're a bit of a, you know, constantly building on that, but I, I've seen other things work more effectively in, in other environments. Okay, great, great. Um, we also have uh, some, some other questions related to uh, the, the challenge of scaling. Mm -hmm. So you've definitely been able to, to scale in, uh, in the past years. And what was the biggest challenge for that? <laughs> I mean, there's, there's a lot of challenges. I think the thing that helps us through this process was knowing what our target structure was and also knowing mm -hmm. that the structure that we had when we were five people compared to the structure that we had when we were 15 people compared to the structure that we have now that we're, we're 55 people it's not the same thing and mm -hmm. having a plan actually for how that organization needed to grow and how what roles were key to fill in that and also preparing people up front for some of these changes has really helped us. Um, it doesn't mean that the changes were easy. So we moved from, you know, a sort of more layered approach to engineering and product to working in, in what we call domains, which map onto a particular business area and making these shifts. We made this shift back in, in March, April this year was pretty challenging. It's a lot of work to communicate a different set of expectations across a hundred, I think with engineering, we're a hundred and we were 150 or so people. Um, and then doing this digitally. So this was back when we couldn't even be in the office all together where you can have mm -hmm. a workshop on a whiteboard. I mean, this, this makes things so much easier, um, but this had helped a lot with the scaling. So I, I think then you can actually cascade responsibilities down, you know, what you can't do when you've got a team that's growing super rapidly is be involved in every conversation and every decision. It's about making sure as much as possible, you have an organization that's set up that can work interdependently, I would say. So we're all working towards the same goals. And it's not to say any one team can work in isolation. Absolutely not. Uh, but that, that people can work towards a goal that's theirs and they feel ownership for it and they also feel empowered to, to make decisions. I mean, this, this is a process for us. It's not, it's not a dumb thing, um, but this, this is both one of the biggest challenges and I think what's also helped us a lot in achieving the, the growth. Was there any uh, methodology in particular that you used in order for, for scaling or was it, let's say, an organic, natural type of, uh, of, yeah. of ownership uh, and roles? 
No, definitely it wasn't a natural. <laughs> it wasn't <laughs> a natural thing. I mean, we started as different product teams, you know, so we'd, there was a product team at WeFox, product team at One, we had our um, product team at, at Cobol. Uh, there were different parts of the, the organization who also became part of product at a particular point in time. So there was no real natural structure in terms of how that worked. Um, but what we did do is we spent a lot of time mapping our organization. So here I mean the broader WeFox organization that interacted with the technology that we built. You know, so we have a claims domain, a financial operations domain. So within the, the organization, each product team has their own set of stakeholders within the organization you know, that they become the experts in. So if you're in the claims domain, you are the expert in claims. You need to know enough about how the, the customer interacts with the claims experience. This is important. And how the, the broker or the agent interacts with the claim experience. But you need to know everything there is to know about claims. And the claims team in-house is your primary stakeholder. And then we also have our, our apps teams who are the experts in their customer. And they're the reverse. They need to know a lot about their customer and enough about each domain to be able okay. to, to curate a positive experience for the customer in collaboration, of course, in this case with the, the claims domain team. So there's, there's a lot of teamwork and creating a little bit of a framework for how we can engage has been a, a bit of an area of focus. We're not nailing it. <laughs> um, there's, there's some parts of the team who really are, are much more advanced than others. And I think this is a really positive thing because it means that there's a good example that people can learn from and also they're you know, creating an environment where people can share their experiences is something that's going to be really important for us going forward so that we can all level up and, and um, that they share best practices to, to make that even more positive and more consistent across the entire product development organization. Sounds but no, good. it was not organic. <laughs> it was, I think, <laughs> yeah, and it's, it's a work in progress. Okay, okay, that's that's very very interesting to, to see your your take on on this. Uh, and there are a lot a lot of things that I could learn because uh, definitely uh, scaling is it's it's the key, and we need to be prepared for for that if we want growth. Yes, plan as uh, much as you can, and then adjust yes. that plan almost constantly. Yes, yes, yes. This is actually one of the challenges that uh, at Pentalog we, we focus with, with other clients and within Pentalog as well, because we, we have been growing a lot in, in the past year. So definitely that process needs to be uh, tweaked and the plan. Mm -hmm. uh, we have another interesting question here, and I, I think it's, it's a very, very good one. Um, what happens from a product perspective with a startup after funding has been covered? Yeah, I mean, it's, we were talking about this the other day and I, I think being well-funded is, is great. Um, it's, it's very much a luxury problem. You have zero excuses, mm -hmm. you know, so you can do everything. You know, if you say, look, we can't blah, blah, blah. People are like, well, you know, why not? Can I hire who you need to, this kind of thing. So I think you are really forced to be disciplined about evaluating what adds value to your user ultimately and through that to the organization um, because you have a little bit more freedom than if you're sort of fighting for your life when you really need to go from funding round to funding round or you know, to, to focus on profitability as, as your number one guiding light, your problem set to solve actually narrows, which from a product perspective is, is nice in a way because it tends to be much more obvious what you should do next. When you've got longer term horizons, you have to come up with that yourself. And I think you do just need to be very clear about what you're trying to achieve, how you're going to measure your success or progress towards that along the way. So you're not flying blind. Um, but yeah, I think you need to be a lot more disciplined actually to, to make sure you are building the right things and you're not just mm -hmm. 
building things because you can. Um, okay. That's the question. Yes, and it, it's definitely for me. It's so so interesting to hear all these answers from from your experience, and I think, well, uh, for a lot of the participants here, they are going to be very very useful. For me, at least, they are very useful. So okay. for sure, uh, for them, uh, it will be as well. Um, we do have uh, some some other questions, and I think this is more related to to the product manager role mm -hmm. and how to become a chief product officer. So we have someone who's asking, what skills should a product uh, manager have in order to become uh, a chief product officer or head of product management? Oh, <laughs> I'm not totally sure I'm a good example because I, I personally didn't set out to become a, a chief product officer. And, you know, I'm very happy to be in this role. I feel extremely fortunate that I, you know, right place, right skill set, right time kind of thing, because I think it, it's something that I personally very much enjoy. And I'd start there, you know, if, if you don't enjoy it, um, it is probably not the right thing for you. And I know that's super vague and open, um, but I think, you know, you get to a certain phase or a certain stage in your growth as a product manager where you've got to make a decision about becoming an individual contributor or down the expert track or being a, a people manager or a group product manager, I think it's often now called, um, and evaluating if that's right for you. I mean, I do very little product management these days. I do a mm -hmm. lot of people management and a lot of communication, a lot of stakeholder management and a lot of admin um, so it's, it's um, the, the role, or at least my experience of the role of CPO is very different from the role of being a product manager. That said, I think a lot of the skills are the same, you know, as a product manager, you need to be able to understand a lot of the contextual environment that you're in. You know, so yes, you're building a product, but you need to understand where your engineering team's at, the level of detail of information that they need. You need to understand your user and the user context. You also need to understand the business and the business context. And I think for me, this is something that can be overlooked by some product managers. We can become very fixated on what is good product management. And at the end of the day, a good product is one that solves the user's needs in a way that delivers value to the business that you're working in. And I think being able to connect all of those things is what would set somebody apart in terms of their growth, both as a product manager, also as a, as a people manager in a product context. It's when you manage people, it's just that the nature of the problems you solve change a little bit and they become more about understanding the organizational landscape then about the the product and the market landscape. Although you do need you do need to you need need those things as well. So I'd, I'd say thriving in complexity and enjoyment of solving all range of problems and uh, not minding a little bit of admin from time to time. Okay, okay, that's very very good insight again. <laughs> um, in terms of of product, uh, another question that we have here. Um, it's more related to product tools. Mm -hmm. What uh, tools have you used or what tools would you recommend in order to manage all that? Mm -hmm. Because you definitely have a very big team. There are definitely a lot of, uh, of ideas. How do you, uh, well, what, what tool manages to, mm -hmm. to cover that or facilitate communication or uh, ensure more visibility? Yeah, this again, I mean, I hate to say this, but this is not something we, um, we're we perfect on and we're not using things as consistently as, as I would like across the team. And we're always experimenting with new things because what worked mm -hmm. when we were 15 people, yeah. it's not working the same way now. You know, so we, in terms of, um, you know, we use Jira and Atlassian. So we're Jira and Confluence with Atlassian, mm -hmm. Slack. We have a very, very standard kind of toolkit. Um, and I'm not actually a huge believer in, in tools. I'm a little bit of a first principles type person. And I think if you understand what you're trying to communicate and you understand well enough the problem that you solve, the tool is not going to, it, it, might, it will make it easier and it'll facilitate that communication, but it's not going to solve the problem for you. And um, so I'll, you know, often 
Google Sheets, some for solving some problems is absolutely fine from my point of view. But I, I do understand that there are tools that can help guide the process. I know a lot of my team have have specific tools, and I personally don't dictate what tools people mm -hmm. use to solve specific problems. But what we do, let's say, insist on is that there's a huge amount of, of transparency. So as much as possible, everything's on Confluence. We have a weekly blog, which is available to the, the entire organization to keep people up to date and informed. And, and this is something actually we're currently looking at transforming to make more relevant to the situation and the size we're in now, because it's, it's just too long. It would take, it takes 15 minutes every week to read because this is the pace where we're, we're doing things and not everything's relevant to everybody else anymore. So I always think going back to the fundamentals, understanding what problem you're trying to solve and then choosing a tool that helps you with the solution. Um, this, this is the way that I'd, I'd go. But um, I, I know this is something other people and other product managers feel a bit more strongly about. Um, Jira, Confluence, Slack, these are working fine for us for now. Okay, and uh, more, uh, let's say, uh, tools like Mixpanel, for instance, to, to get more insight about the use of the product or or is there anything in particular that you are uh, you are doing yeah. on, on that side? I mean, we started experimenting with a couple of these. Um, I think one's called Maze. The team are looking at to see if if this can help us understand mm -hmm. or more quickly identify where we can improve the user experience and the user journey. So this is on the customer side. Uh, we're in this like luxury situation on our advisor side because we can actually just sit down next to them and sort of say, hey, let, let me watch you use this. You very quickly see what is working and what's not working. Um, but yeah, we, we keep it pretty light, to be honest. Okay, okay, understood. And we have two other very interesting uh, questions, but they go in, in, into different areas. Mm -hmm. Since we've been talking a lot about team, about skills, um, and uh, we have one question here that uh, is, what are the key competences or personality characteristics that you value, value most within the team? Mm -hmm. It can be management, it can be development team. Yeah. So what, what do you look for uh, in your team in order to build the right team? Yeah, I mean, I'm a, a mathematician by training, so I'm a very logical, rational person. And um, I, I think sometimes to a fault. And I find for me and the teams that I work effectively with, looking for those highly analytical traits, you know, natural mm -hmm. problem solvers, curiosity, but also the ability to communicate clearly um, and in a, a well-constructed way f as a product manager, I think is a really key trait um, you essentially the job is about identifying a problem that creates value if you solve it and this takes a, a very analytical mind um, mm -hmm. to be able to do that and then you also need somebody with quite a lot of let's say nat natural logic to break that problem down into its components to ultimately solve them so this is, is something that I would look for although the extent to that is, is different depending on the part of the products that they'd be working on. So we've got, um, you know, the skill set that we would have in our customer facing teams is, is probably different to the skill set that we've got in, you know, our accounting and financial reporting domain, mm -hmm. for example. So these are these are big generalizations and I actually think you need to, to find the right person for the right role or the right role for the right person. If you're in the luxury situation to do that, I think that's even better. Um, but that, that would be one. I think product managers need to find a way to put their ego to one side. We fall in love with our own ideas. I, I do it too. Um, but they're often not the best ones. You know, so a, a, the best product managers I've seen are able to put their own opinion on hold. Mm -hmm. It is one of many opinions and to keep a very open mind um, and I think the, the product managers who can do this, in, in my experience, have been the most effective. Okay. Not always That's... an easy thing to do, though. I, I know that. <laughs> That's very, very good. Um, we can now move to, to another question, which I think is very, very uh, important because you touched upon at the beginning of the discussion on 
well, the, the reputation that the insurance uh, industry domain has. So we have someone here asking, what is WeFox strategy for dealing with the mythical uh, mistrust of customer towards insurance products? Moreover, what's the strategy for dealing with the mythical resistance of German customers towards digital products, which seems to stem from fear of uh, failable security or reliability? Mm -hmm. So I, I think that's a very, very uh, strong and complex question, and it would be great to hear your take on this. Yeah, yeah I mean, as a, let's say, not German person, I both in, in this role and at my previous company, which was worth keep, was in wealth management, I've been a little bit surprised by the level of digitalization uh, in, in this country. And what surprised me the most is that this isn't necessarily the technical constraints or a capability constraint. This is actually driven a lot by the end consumer. And mm -hmm. there is a reluctance for people to use digital services. And what I think sets WeFox apart is that we're going to where the customer is you know, so we, we really believe in intermediaries in insurance. And, you know, we saw the success at one and now we Fox Insurance of activating a human advisor network to, to overcome that, you know, that social validation. When you buy a complex product like insurance, I mean, insurance is weird. You don't have anything except a promise at the end of it. Yeah. It kind of makes sense that people, if they click a button, they're a bit like, cool, <laughs> you know, what do I have? You, you've got an electronic contract. So I, I do get that. I, it was a strange realization for me because I was like, what do you mean I can't buy health insurance online when I came to Germany? I, I honestly it just hadn't occurred to me that I'd have to talk to someone to get health insurance. Mm -hmm. This is a strong cultural difference. So understanding the customer's relationship and, and working with things as they are today, rather than trying to fight that and say, look, the only way that you'll be able to buy our insurance is digitally. This is not at all what we're about. We want to make that experience better for the customer, not to make them uncomfortable. And, and this is why we really work with, with intermediaries and advisors to, to create a safe feeling for the customer so that they have confidence in that rather than asking them to behave differently because we believe it's the future over time, I personally believe it is the future, mm -hmm. but we need to, to go with, go to where the customers are and work with them, not to try and force them to, to do something that they're not ready for yet. Okay, that's, uh, that's a very, very good uh, uh, approach, uh, definitely, especially when, when there are uh, cultural differences. Um, <laughs> yes, yes. Um, we have some, some other questions as well, and I'm really surprised because there are more questions than, than usual uh, for, for a pentabar. So that's, that's very, very good. Um, like questions. Yes. I could have added yes. that actually to my list of what makes a good product manager, somebody who asks a lot of questions. So I think this is a good <laughs> sign if there are lots of product people on the call. Perfect, perfect. So uh, I, I did hear a lot about this, uh, this topic and it would be very good to hear from you as well. Mm -hmm. How do you work with the marketing team on mm -hmm. your products? Is the marketing team part of the product team? Is there a, a, a growth type mm -hmm. of, of team? How do you combine those? Because I did hear different takes and it depends on, on different situations and the stage yeah. where, uh, where the company and the product uh, are. Uh, so uh, what, what, what is your uh, strategy from mm -hmm. this perspective? Yeah, I think it's a really interesting question. And there's always, um, I think there's a couple of, let's say, interfaces with the product team that are always contentious. One's with engineering and the other one is, is with marketing. So, you know, we are not a direct-to-consumer brand. And so our relationship with marketing, I think, is a bit different to what it would be if we were. I think when you are D to C, you know, the, the two things need to go absolutely hand in glove. Um, because we have a distribution strategy through intermediaries, it's more about, you know, networking. So we work closely with our sales teams or, or broker support teams, if you like, or one of our, our most important partners in the organizations. 
and these are, are um, let's say there's a high degree of, of communication with them on these things. So, so not so much marketing, but sales, but of course we, we do work with marketing because there are touch points there. And at the end of the day, both marketing and product have a, a, are part of the voice of the company towards the customer are just at different stages of the funnel. So where we work with them is a lot around the, the CRM communication. So how we communicate to the customers that we already have. So this is very much a collaboration between product marketing, but also our local operations teams. Um, when it comes to, to another strong area of, of overlap would be something like the, the website. And so it could be, well, the model that we're moving towards is that we focus on building this system that allows marketing or the local teams to communicate mm -hmm. to, to the different stakeholders that we have as WeFox um, using, using that as, as a piece of communication. So we would see it more as a we build tools to enable not just marketing, but other stakeholders around our organization to do their jobs effectively. And then it's about having a very clear and shared understanding of what is our voice to the customer and what are we communicating when um, and aligning on that. But I, I do see that when you have a, a D2C or a direct to consumer product, I mean, these, these two things have to be completely in sync in exactly the same way that a product team and an engineering team need to be in sync. I mean, we all have the same goal. I think marketing product and operations all play a super important role but the role is different everybody needs to understand what their role is but also needs to understand and have a pre an appreciation of what the the other departments contribute to that success and i think that's the starting point great great um there's also another question focused on on another topic that uh, we mentioned at the beginning you, you said that you like to get things uh well uh, the product to, to get to the people faster mm -hmm. uh to, to to get feedback um when do you know you've done enough testing when uh, uh when when do you stop experimenting and just go for it yeah i mean we are still at the um the steep part of the curve Right, so we're not yet with, with our product, our digital products or our insurance products, we're not yet at the point where we're kind of tweaking things to make them, mm -hmm. to optimize them. Um, so for us, it's, it's quite easy actually. You put it into the world, it works, it doesn't work. You know? And we, the way that, that I'm working with the teams to prioritize anything, whether it's a tweak or a new feature, you know, everything is based on, on value. So do we understand the metric that we're trying to move and why? And also, I mean, the, the cost. So if you think about, you know, opti I, this is my mathematical <laughs> mind, I think. You're trying to optimize the area under the curve. I mean, that's essentially what a product manager's job is. How do we deliver as much value as we can with the capacity that we've got? And, you know, capacity could be engineering capacity and time. Um, it could be budget if you're working with external teams, whatever that is, that's, that's kind of the thing. So you have to ask yourself, if I invest another 10, 10 days into this or whatever mm -hmm. your time frame is, what's the potential upside? And what could I invest in instead that would actually be more valuable? And so understanding those things, so both what is the impact for each unit of cost of this, this investment, and importantly, and something that we often overlook, what is the opportunity cost? So what else could I be doing that is adding more value? And if you understand those two things, you, you shouldn't get caught in a trap of endless optimizations. Um, although it can be tempting. I, I'm not that much of a perfectionist, um, but I think a lot of people are, and I totally understand that, why you, you want the perfect onboarding journey. Uh, but yes, sometimes a good enough onboarding journey is, is good enough and then you should move on to something else, knowing that you can always cycle back when that becomes the next area where you can add the, the most value by investing in. Great. Uh, very good. Uh, very good advice on, on that side. Um, and since you are working with, with such a big team and you have 
uh, a very big development team if you were mentioning around 100 on 150 people how do you manage all the pressure all the stress all the well everything because uh, you definitely have deadlines you definitely have objectives you do have a very complex uh, north star mm. how do you manage th that I mean, have a, a great team. I think is, is <laughs> have really, a great I mean, team. <laughs> this this is a is a big part of it, honestly. I mean, mm -hmm. you have to trust the people that you're working with, um, and that they'll, you know, you, if if you don't have that, I don't think you could do the job. To be honest, it would, it would be too much. But I think you, you know, something that I personally learned and really focused on during the last couple of years when we're in lockdown, in particular, is you have to look after yourself you know for me that means doing yoga it does mean catching up with friends on the weekend you know, taking a friday off every now and then um, these things are important and if you don't prioritize those things as well um, yes I, I can imagine it would be <laughs> very unpleasant so yeah i mean give make it make it not optional to take the time to invest in your own health and well-being i think this this is key Definitely, this is part of, of the company culture as well, uh, in order for yes, you to, to grow. Absolutely. And I, I think this is something that, um, I mean, I've, yeah, I think you really have a responsibility as a leader to live that. So, you know, everybody can say, oh, yeah, we've got 28 holiday days, but if you're not taking your holiday days, you're not setting the right tone for the organization. I think not only is it good for you, um, but it, it's also good for your team to, to take that time. Oh, very, very good point. Um, where where do you see WeFox in, in two years? In two um, years? Yes. I mean, we'll be spread out over Europe, looking at Asia and the US. Um, we will have third party insurances on our platform. We'll have a much bigger customer reach. I think we'll be at the place where we have got the simplicity you know we, we've got work to do here and we know we do but this will be the the simplest easy to manage easiest to manage insurance experience certainly in the european markets um, this this i think we'll we'll have done in two years wow that's uh that's very very ambitious but i i am sure you are going to you are going to make it maybe even faster than two years who knows <laughs> <laughs> i was gonna say i'm like mm. <laughs> <laughs> maybe do. maybe we don't have the time um but yeah yeah it's, it's all possible but for sure you are going to do great and two years from now we are going to meet and you say oh you do you remember in 2021 yeah, i might, I might be in mexico <laughs> please come to mexico please it's it, it's wonderful here and and i'm sure you are going to to like it so maybe when you move to the to the u.s market you'll need to <laughs> <laughs> to Absolutely. come to Mexico <laughs> to be on the same time zone. <laughs> good, good plan. Yes, sounds sounds very very good. Um, well, I think we are about uh, at the end of our uh, allocated time here. It was a wonderful discussion. I learned a lot, a lot, and I'm sure the participants have learned have learned too. Uh, so, uh, thank you very very much for for your time, for your insights, for your experience, and definitely. Uh, we can use as, uh, as, as advice everything that, that you told us today and hopefully other people will, will use this in order to grow their, their companies, their products. Uh, so thank you, thank you very much for this. Thank you for having me. Uh, have a great uh, afternoon there in, in have Berlin. Have a great day. <laughs> thank you and, and talk to you soon. <laughs> uh, thanks, Andrea. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.